Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for day two of the Tomcat track. Today, Egal Sapir is going to be talking to us about reverse proxying with Nginx. Egal has been a committer and PMC member for a couple of years now, and um, he is going to bring his expertise to our track today. Thank you very much, Egal. Thank you. And thank you all for joining me. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so I'll try to rush, but not too fast, so I can show you all the great and exciting things, or at least the most exciting things that we can do with Nginx. Uh, by show of hands, who is using Nginx? Just kidding, I cannot see your hands. So anyway, reverse proxying with Nginx. Uh, pronounce Nginx, because some people uh, mispronounce products. So uh, I always like to clarify that. Why Nginx? It's reliable, cross-platform, very high performance, and it's actively de developed. Actually, a, a new version was released uh, yesterday. It's very popular and trending. And as of uh, August, the August 2020 serve, uh, web server survey, they say that if the current trend continues, it will soon be um, the number one web server. Right now, Apache HTTPD is still uh, the top. And it's a free and open source software, which uh, we all uh, love. There are commercial offerings like uh, Nginx Plus and, of course, support services, uh, support agreements, etc. cetera. Uh, my name is Igal Sapir. I'm an open source advocate. I work as a software architect and help organizations with their growing pains, uh, especially when it comes to performance, stability, and security. I've been developing uh, web apps for more than 20 years and been using Nginx in front of them for more than 10. Installation of Nginx is uh, straightforward. There are package managers for all the um, main operating systems. Uh, Debian, Red Hat, etc. Uh, you can also download the Windows binaries uh, or build it from source. And of course, you can use it uh, in a container, as I will show in this. Uh, so this is the IIS killer. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the chat. I'm sorry. So uh, by the way, if anybody has questions, feel free to interrupt me um, in between. I'm OK with that. So some useful commands of the Nginx executable. Um, we have, uh, so in general, you run, you write Nginx and then the switch. So dash T would test the config file. Uh, dash C would allow you to specify a non-default uh, config file name. Uh, dash S is uh, very useful to send a signal. For example, reload the config so you don't need to restart or interrupt the service. Uh, and then we have uh, the lower V and the uppercase V. And actually, I can show it real quick. Um, as I mentioned right here, I'm using a containerized version. So I will get into uh, the machine. Can everybody see it clearly? Is it large enough? Hopefully you can. The, the chat doesn't scroll, so it's hard for me to see. So anyway, I, if I type here Nginx, dash T to test the config. It tells me the config file is fine. If I run it with dash V, lowercase V gives me the simple version information. And if with uppercase V, it would show me the full version information, including all of the modules that were source, you can include or exclude the module. So let's continue here. A configuration file structure. In general, there are contexts and directives. The main context is implicit. So anything outside of a context is, belongs to the main context. Then inside context, you have directives and parameters. For example, you can set the user 
account uh, under which uh, Nginx will run. So user www group www. And then you can define the HTTP context with server and listen. Default file name for configuration is nginx.conf. You can use the dash C uh, argument or switch to uh, set a different one. Um, and the configuration file is made of contexts, directives, variables, literals, and comments. Uh, all the regular expressions by default are using the PCRE library, so it's Perl syntax by default. But that's something that I guess you can if you build from source, you might be able to change it, but why? Context defines scopes. So for example, you have a scope for HTTP, you can have a scope for mail. Uh, the main scope, as I mentioned, is implicit, it's a top level. Uh, you can have a scope for stream if you do a layer four, OSI level four uh, proxying. Um, and uh, two of the common nested scopes that we use in reverse proxying are uh, the HTTP uh, server, which goes into HTTP, and location, which goes usually into server. The directives follow the pattern of a directive name and then parameters. Most of them use one parameter, some use more. And there are three directive types. Standard, which means there is only one value for that directive. So if you set it twice, uh, the second, the last one wins. Whenever you set it again, it overrides the previous uh, directive of the same name. There is the array type, which adds. So if you put it like seven times, you'll have seven directives for that. And that's usually common with, let's say, add header. You want multiple headers. You don't want one to overwrite the, the previous uh, headers. And there is a command type like try files, which tells Nginx how to do different things. Uh, all of the directives, each directive has allowed scopes. And documentation shows very clearly uh, for each directive, what is the scope and what is the, the default. So I will share the slides later and you can click or just go to nginx.org uh, documentation. Uh, they have sensible defaults. Many times you don't need to change something. Don't change it if you don't know what you're doing, like in any server configuration. But if you do know, definitely do so because it can help you fine tune the server. Uh, nested scopes inherit from their um, parent scope. So whenever you have a directive in a parent scope and you don't set the same directive, you don't put it in the nested scope, it, it inherits from the parent. But once you uh, put the same directive inside the nested scope, it overrides the parent. So something to keep in mind. Um, some common directives are listen, include, uh, index, which is equivalent to the uh, welcome file in Tomcat, auto index, which allows directory listings, etc. Uh, variables, all the identifiers begin with the dollar symbol. Uh, and there are two types of variables. There are built-in variables and there are custom defined, user defined variables. Uh, some notable built-in variables, the uh, host scheme, which would be either HTTP or HTTPS, the request URI, etc. cetera. Um, Something to remember, there is a difference between the URI variable and the request URI variable. Request URI is the original request URI, and URI is a normalized version that is changed each time you re rewrite uh, something in your in rewriting, which we'll get to soon. Um, some of the variables follow the pattern of for example, HTTP headers would be HTTP underscore and then the header name. 
So HTTP underscore XYZ would be uh, the header with the name XYZ. Um, args is the full query string. And then if you have, for example, a Q equals search or whatever, a query, or the query value, then you'll have arg underscore Q. Uh, same for cookies. So you can have a cookie uh, underscore J session ID. And there is a list in the reference of all of the uh, variables. Uh, some modules define their own variables. For example, the HTTP core module uh, defined these variables. And then there's a bunch of others that are available all across. Um, User-defined variables. So these follow the format of set, variable name, and the value. There is no equal sign. Uh, for example, I can set a variable, call it no cache, set it to zero, and then under certain conditions, update it to one. So for example, if in this case, if a query string named fresh uh, was passed and it's not empty string and it's not zero, then that would evaluate, evaluate to through, and then it we update here the variable to one. Then we can make use of that variable. For example, if we use caching, we can say, OK, bypass the cache if that variable is truthy. Uh, another way to define variables, which is uh, even uh, more efficient than set, is the map directive. And the map directive is a structure, as we can see here in the example, it takes the source variable and the newly defined variable. So in this example, I show how to extract the date uh, out of the ISO 8601 time format. And the digits from the time will be in this capture group, and then I set the value of date underscore ESO to that capture group. And then, for example, I can use that variable um, to create a rolling log file, because now I can use it uh, in the file name of the access logs, as I show in the example here. Uh, a more elaborate example of map. Uh, there is a module that is not installed by default, but you can, I'm sorry, not compiled by default. You can uh, compile your own or grab a distribution that has it. And in this, uh, in this case, I show how you can take the GOAP country code variable that comes from that module and create a new, uh, a new variable called is EU. So we set the default to zero. And if the country is one of those European Union uh, countries, I hope I didn't uh, forget any, then EZU would be one. Otherwise, it would default to zero. Then you can do different things like uh, show the user, you know, GDPR uh, statements, etc. Um, it's confusing to read. Yeah, I didn't come up with it. So, but I can clarify. If there's anything I can clar clarify, uh, please write in the chat. Or, or Chris, feel free to jump in and say things if I miss them. Cool. Um, I often use variables to troubleshoot things. For example, I in this example, I show how I create a URI. So that's a location that matches exactly the URI slash time. And if that URI is matched and that location is matched, then I add headers, um, set the content type to application JSON just for readability in the browser or the client, add a few headers, and then I can return actually the status code of 200 and an actual string which will build that JSON format. So actually, I can open this in a new browser, and this is. This is that, um, you can see the URL here, time. 
slash time. And this is from Nginx directly. It's not, um, not using application server or anything like that. And if I refresh it, you see that the time actually changes. So it's not uh, static. The config file, uh, the minimal and useless config must have the event scope. I don't know why it makes no sense whatsoever. Everything else is um, as default. If you don't put the event scope, even if it's empty, you get an error. Um, if you want to make use of the events scope, then one useful thing is to put the worker connections, um, which is the maximum number of open files. Yes, Chris, I will get to that, definitely. That's why we're here. Uh, so, the default is 512, but usually would say to 1024, 2048, and that's per worker. So um, that's a useful. You don't want to overdo that because if you have uh, eight workers and too many open files, you'll get the you'll exceed the U limit and get an error. So, but it's a configuration on your server which you should know. Error logs, um, very straightforward. Error log, the path, and the level. Um, one, the default level is error. You can also set, instead of the path, you can set STD error or syslog. Uh, one useful thing that I do when I want to troubleshoot URL rewriting is to set it to notice and set the directive rewrite log on. And then all of the URL writing is also displayed in the error logs. But that's that can be very verbose. So obviously, you don't want to do it in production and just leave it there. Access logs, um, the directive is access log, the file, a format which you can define elsewhere, and some options. Um, for example, you can do also conditional logging, either by using the option if, and check for some variable or uh, put it in a location. So for example, if I serve static resources from a location that starts with slash res, I can set the error access log off and that will not log all the images and CSS style sheets, etc. cetera. Um, if you still want to log the 404s, then you can add log not found on and those will go actually into the error log. Uh, last one wins. Yes, last one wins. And also, there is the matter of nesting. So uh, it depends how specific. There is specific specificity. Uh, so it depends which location match. But if they're on the same level, then last one wins, yes. And some directive may not be um, declared more than once. So it really depends on the directive. So here is an example where I define two different log formats. One is standard and one is upstream. Standard, um, just have the regular things that you might be interested in, uh, the, while the upstream has some other information. For example, I add here the cookie J session ID and a request ID. The request ID is a unique identifier that's created by Nginx and one thing I find uh, very useful is to log it both in Nginx and in Tomcat. And then when I have to uh, trace an error, I can see exactly which error, uh, which request the error belongs to. So once I define these two different formats, I can use them in two different places. For example, I can set the default access log to standard and then in the location named Tomcat, uh, along with all the other proxy configs, I can specify that I want to use the upstream logs format. Okay, virtual hosts. Uh, virtual hosts are defined using the HTTP modules uh, server directive. So 
the main scope is HTTP. Then we have the server scope in it. And the most notable directives are listen, server name, and root. And uh, listen, we specify either the address and or port or Unix domain socket if we, we do a, a inter-process communication. Uh, the default is all IPs at port 80. If Nginx is running uh, as non-privileged user, then it would be uh, all addresses port 8000. And you can specify the parameter default server to make it default. You can also specify if it's port 443, for example, uh, SSL and HTTP2. And if you do add IPv6, they need to be uh, in brackets because, uh, because of that. It needs to know how to separate the IP address from the port. The second important thing in uh, the server virtual host server name, uh, you put a white space delimited list of server names or patterns. Uh, the patterns can have either leading or trailing uh, asterisk wildcard, but not both. Or they can have a regex with capture groups. Uh, the order of precedence is first of all exact match, then the longest match that has a wildcard prefix. If that's not found, then the longest that has a, a trailing wildcard. And the fourth uh, in line is the regex. And the regex goes uh, by order of appearance in the config file. So whichever was, show, uh, was found first, as opposed to those which would be the longest regardless of their position in the file. Um, for performance sake, if you know an exact match, just use the exact match because why go through, you know, why why add CPU cycles unnecessarily? And the root directive specifies the, the path to the root directory of the site. Um, so this is an example which I usually don't do in production, but if you do multi-hosting with many sites, you can do that. I set the server name to a regex with a capture group and a variable name domain. And then you can use the domain in the root. So um, a request to, regardless of www, should be server name. No, this is a directive. That's not a variable, that's a directive. So whatever, if you go to, let's say, mysite.com, then it will go to, it will set the root to slash serve slash www slash mysite.com. Chris, did that answer your question? Okay. Right. Yeah, that's part of the, that's a capture group in the regex. This is where I use the variable. Cool. Okay, example configuration. This is very basic. Create a server. Listen on port 80, which is redundant, but clear. Server name, acah20.demo, and the root directory. And if you want to enable SSL and HTTP2, you can add directive listen 443 SSL HTTP2. Uh, obviously, if you do that, you need to set the path to the certificate uh, key and the file. I know that, uh, Chris, you would love that. Um, and you can keep all of it together. But if you want to disable port 80 for that server, then you can just remove it. Uh, if you keep both, then to listen on both port 80 and 443. So you can have multiple uh, listen directives there. Uh, this is an example to redirect www to non-www, very common thing. So for example, if you go to uh, www ACH 20demo it redirects keeping the scheme and keeping the request URI. Uh, you have to keep in mind that 
This is not listening on port 443 because I didn't specify the SSL certificate for it. If you if you want it to also be for 443, you need to specify that. Um, I can show real quick an example. So if I copy this and I run curl, you can see uh, that it's 301 moved to, yeah. So originally when I prepared that, I started with ACNA, uh, Apache Core North America, which was the old name, but obviously this time it's not. So this directs you to the new name. And uh, similarly, this redirects HTTP to HTTPS. So if I take this and run it here, you see that the curl to HTTP uh, would go to HTTPS, ACH20.demo. Um, and you can block requests that have no host header. So for example, you set the server to only listen if there is no host and return a 406, which is not acceptable. Location, location, location. All of the, the all of the patterns are matched by location. So um, this is one of the most used directives, and it can be tricky at times, especially when you uh, when you nest locations. Uh, the directive is the location, a modifier, and a URI pattern. The modifier can be nothing, which has the lowest priority. Uh, and, and it's a prefix match. So anything that starts uh, with that prefix will be matched. But again, that's the lowest priority. Um, the highest priority is if you put an equal sign. So for example, equal slash some path will match exactly that path and nothing else, but it's the fastest way to deliver. Uh, it doesn't need to check anything else. Um, there is also a high priority prefix as opposed to the low priority prefix, and it's prefixed by that. This is not a regular expression, this is a prefix. But if you use that uh, modifier, then the regular expressions are not checked. Okay, time flies. Um, so, you, there is also case sensitive and case insensitive regexes and the priority matters. So again, if you have weirdness, you, I, I would take, Chris, I would take uh, questions during, so I don't, I'm not gonna do a hard stop if that's okay. Um, excellent. Uh, rewrites, so rewrite, regex, pattern, uh, regex or pattern, it doesn't have to be a regex pattern, but it's one of those patterns that are matched. I guess it should be a URI pattern. And the rewritten URI and a flag. Um, so when you have different blocks with different patterns, some of them call the others. So uh, in general, you can actually have an infinite loop, which will break if you, if you have a, a 10, internal redirects, that's what it's called, each time it goes from one location to another. If uh, if you exceed 10 of them, you'll get a 500 error from Nginx. So you don't want to do that. Uh, what you do want to do is have the best locations, rewrite to one another as needed, and you can use some flags. The most notable flags are break and last. When last says, this is the last URL rewrite. Do it and then don't do more rewrites. That's in order to prevent that. And break says, this is the last one. Just process it and uh, return. That, that's it, don't, don't do any rewrites. Uh, there are also name locations. So for example, you can define a location with the add symbol, call it add rewrite rules, and then put whatever directives here, you can put uh, as many rewrite rules as you want. I usually separate my URL writes to a separate include file and just include that. Uh, this way, if someone else needs to modify or add a new write rule, 
they don't touch the main configuration file and they have uh, less chance of messing up something. And one way to use it is using the try files. So with the try file directive in this format, um, Nginx will search for this URI or the URI with slash, which will do the index page. Uh, and if they're not found, only if they're not found, it will go to the rewrite rules. Uh, custom error pages, um, directive zero page, error page code, and then whatever you want to do with it. I like to pass it to a dynamic page uh, when it makes sense. So I actually pass it to a Tomcat. I'm, I'm running a server called Lucy, which processes the .cfm files. It's similar to JSP. Um, Lucy for the win. Lucy, <laughs> L-U-C-E-E. -E. Uh, so for example, I can define an error page that would go to Lucy, but then inside the static resources images directory, I can return a PNG that shows a nicely uh, um, that it's um, not found. So I created that. If I go to this page, this is a custom error handler from Lucy. Um, a bit big, but you can see it's uh, you can see by a timestamp that it's uh, dynamic anyway. I think I'll shift that would work. Uh, let me not mess with it, let me just do it this way. Reverse proxying to Tomcat. So, a uh, location slash that's I usually that's the most common thing. Try files, if the URI exists, serve it. If the directory exists, serve the um, index page. If not, go to the name location, name Tomcat. And in the name location, I do proxy pass to HTTP. In this case, assuming Tomcat is listening at localhost 8080. Uh, if you don't add any URI, then this is added for you by default. So don't add it if you don't need to. Thank you, Charlie, for the clarification. Um, if you want to, a, a more a better example would be to create an upstream using directive and actually uh, declare multiple servers. So in this example, I create an upstream called Tomcat servers. And I can define multiple Tomcat servers. I can give some of them a different weight. For example, if this will be weight two and you have four of them, so this will be 50% of the traffic. And you can specify that this one, for example, will be a backup and only work if the others uh, fail. Uh, there are more settings available and more advanced configurations available in Nginx Plus, but we're focusing here on the FOSS. Um, you can also set the IP hash, which would uh, do sticky routing by the IP C class. Uh, so it takes the, in IPv4, it will take the three parts, first three, uh, quarters of the IP address and always direct you there. Um, another example, so, so this uses the same example, same idea, but instead of passing it to localhost port 8080, it actually passes it to the Tomcat server cluster. And I would show you a load the balance demo uh, where you have four Tomcat server is using equal weight. And if I go here, you can see uh, that uh, CFML script uh, that's running by Lucy inside Tomcat checks the uh, local address, local IP address. And by that, it, def it figures out if it's Tomcat 1, 2, 3, or 4. And this is round robin by default. But again, you can do other configurations. Um, Go back here. So the load balance demo, if I would, um, let's say, kill one of these. So now it's stopping Tomcat 3 out of the 4. And now if I go here and reload. So it's trying to access actually Tomcat 3 now, and there is a 30 second by default timeout, which you can change. And we don't have 30 seconds to waste in this presentation, it seems. Uh, Chris, what's my time? 
How much time I have? But at the end of the 30 seconds, you see it went to Tomcat 4. So it didn't even fail. You know, the user didn't even get an error. And if I reload, you see 1, 2, and 4. So let's go back to the slides. And if I actually reactivate started, hopefully it's ready by now, and I'll reload the page. Now it detected that three is alive and it passes request to it again. Um, so uh, we don't have time, but I wanted to show a demo. If, if you um, uncomment the IP hash that I have here in the directive, uncomment this and reload, you will see that I'm always directed to the same uh, Tomcat because I'm using the same IP. Uh, don't repeat yourself, right? So use includes. Sometimes you cannot, because of directives, whenever you add a directive, it overwrites all the others of the same ones. And um, what I usually do is I would use proxy set header and all of the configuration to Tomcat with the proxy pass, etc., in an include file. So I create this file, nginx Tomcat proxy, and I create a file called nginx security, which would allow certain networks, deny all the others, uh, optionally turn on a basic authorization. Uh, and uh, the format uh, is the same as the Apache HTTPD. And if you say satisfy all, then it will make sure that both auth basic and the network is matched before it allows to serve the request. And then you just use, in this location, I want to pass anything with the extension CFM or JSP. It's using HTTP. So that's actually, when, when you define a cluster, it's here. Oh. It's, it's going to Tomcat at uh, port 8080. Yes, HTTP. Um, there was a more a clear example where it shows the local host. So for example, all of the CFM, .cfm or .gsp would include only the proxy config and the ones that go to slash manager or the Lucy admin would also include the security uh, uh, file. Uh, caching content. Okay, so this is probably my last demo given the time that we have. Uh, what I do here, I check if we have a cookie with, JS with session ID. Uh, J session ID. If so, I set a variable called session cookie exists. Default is not. Uh, if it's eight characters or longer, uh, then I set it to one. And then I define a proxy cache to the URI slash slow. And if uh, if the cookie exists, if this variable is is true, then I bypass the cache. So this is very useful. Um, the cache is used by a regular HTTP cache control that comes from Tomcat. So I give it 60 seconds in this demo. And if I open this, this is a script that on purpose slips for a couple of seconds. And every time I reload it, you see it slips for a couple of seconds. Um, but if I'll take this URL and open an incognito, so here it doesn't have the session ID. And you can see that you see it comes back very fast. It comes back immediately, but it's a second resolution. So very useful. And if I'll find my slides again. OK, time to wrap it up. So you can also do rate limiting, and there are common pitfalls and other modules. and Wrap it up. So I hope you learned something. It was quite intense, I think, but I wanted to uh, add as much as possible. So thank you for joining me. And please feel free to connect. Uh, 
and ping me with questions. I'll uh, do what I can to help. Thanks very much, Egal. Thank you. Uh, jean frederic Claire will be presenting from a cluster to a cloud in, well, immediately following this. So uh, we'd love to have you join us in that session and for the rest of the day. Thank you.